Christianity is so it's the biggest religion in the world that we have the luxury of choosing to fall, be in a church that aligns so specifically with what we believe. Um, and so, yeah, I think it can get unhealthy because how cool that it's the biggest religion in the world, but how frustrating is it that we're like then the most divided. Um, we're supposed to be unified over one thing. You just heard the voice of Reverend Gracie Millard, an associate pastor at Treach Memorial United Methodist Church. Thanks for listening to the Life Plus God podcast. My name is Alyssa Robinson. I am your host, and we are trying to answer the question, why are there different denominations in Christianity? And not just different denominations, like thousands and thousands of different denominations. There's so many of them that all have such different takes on the Bible and spirituality and what it means to be in relationship with God. And it gets to a point where you're just like, wait a second, like, (laughs) do we believe the same things or are we completely different religions at this point? Right. So... Gracie, thanks so much for being here and wrestling with this topic. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very Pollyanna view of things, but I think all of us have had the thought at some point of like, can't we just all get along? Yeah, like, <laughs> no, I think that all the time. <laughs> like, is it, do our differences really matter that much? And mm-hmm. then I go to a church of a different denomination and every now and then I'm like, yeah, they matter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what was your general general take on like the presence of different denominations and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, it's hard to imagine a world without denominations. I don't think that was ever Jesus's goal for us, um, was to have different denominations. I think, um, it's normal to have different beliefs about things, but I think it does, uh, I think we can all know and see throughout history that denominations have gotten like the separation of denominations have gotten violent and um, done terrible things in the name of Christ. Um, People have gotten angry and uh, started wars over this kind of thing. And that's just like so far from what (laughs) Jesus wanted for us. Um, So I think it's, It's sad in a way that it's gotten to a point of violence and um, almost like a tribalism of people um, distinguishing themselves as different from other people um, versus unified. But I think it's it's natural that uh, people kind of fell into, well, I believe this. This feels more right to me, so I'm going to worship in a place that I is most closely aligned with my, what I believe. Um, because like, I'm like you, it would be hard to go to a church that is not, does not practice or, um, live out Christianity in the way that I am used to. And that I understand it's hard to sit there with an open mind (laughs) to Mm -hmm. think, yeah, we're all part of the same thing. It's really hard. Well, especially when there's this idea of like, I don't know, I don't think anyone in this modern day, back when we were starting wars, absolutely. But, um, well, actually that wasn't that long ago in some locations, but, um, for, it, it feels like if I were to go and sit in a different denomination, uh, there's this sense of like, there's a right way and a wrong Mm -hmm. way. And we, as our denomination, have gotten it right. Uh And every other denomination has missed the mark in some way. Right. And so it's not, it it seems to be more than just saying, oh, you know, it's a difference in opinion and difference in interpretation. Mm -hmm. And it feels to, it it goes to the place of like, I'm right, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That there's a binary versus a... black instead of black and white that there could possibly be gray yeah i don't know 
It's hard for us. <laughs> it's really well, hard. let's go back in time, shall we? Let's. Um, can you share a little bit about the historical factors that contributed to all of this like splitting of denominations? Because like in the beginning, we were one church, right? To a certain degree, kind of, um, because once Jesus like sent everybody out and was like, go make disciples of all nations, um, all the disciples went out uh, into different parts of the world, the known world. Um, so according to how they learned Jesus, what, what they learned from Jesus, um, and then sort of influenced the areas that they went to. Um, so, I mean, as early as like 30 years after Jesus's ascension, uh, Paul literally writes in one of the letters, the, the Corinthians, actually right off the bat. And he is like, um, hey, some of y'all are saying, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos as two different people. And he's like, that's not the point. You need to be unified. So like already right off the bat, Paul is like, this is a problem mm -hmm. <laughs> that y'all are starting to divide and say, well, I attribute, I subscribe to this version, like this understanding of Christ. And Paul is like, no, 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 you've all been, uh, you've all been baptized in the name of Christ, not in the name of Paul, not in the name of Apollos. Um, so literally from the beginning, unfortunately, um, but we don't get a, any sort of denomination until, um, well, Catholic, both Catholics and um, Eastern Orthodox, which is the church that's uh, like the Greek and Syrian and um, Egyptian, the, that, the East and West split kind of, but both of those um, both the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox would say that they are not denominations. They are pre-denominational. Um, but it gets all into about politics and power. And, um, a lot of, a lot of it is based on theological disagreements. So what, wait, 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 okay. what is a denomination? If, if Catholicism and Orthodox are not denominations, well, how are we defining what it is to be yeah, a denomination? So I say that, but not fully understanding because they don't want to be lumped as like, they were part of the originals, what they say, and that everything else that came after is a denomination. Um, I think a shorthand, we would just call them different denominations um i guess based off of the what came out of their churches that there's pretty much two really distinct branches of christianity and that's the roman catholic and then the eastern orthodox and out of roman catholic is where we see mo ones that our side of the world is most familiar with the all every everything from the protestant reformation came from that Catholic branch. And then from there on, it goes into even more denominations. Cause I guess I always just thought of a denomination as, um, your understanding mm -hmm. of theology. It's like, it's mm -hmm. kind of like an interpretation of sure. like, okay, I'm aligning with like-minded people who have the same interpretation of theology as I do. Yeah. And we're forming this group and, yeah. we're and it's called a denomination. Yeah. But so I guess for me, Catholic and Orthodox falls into that of like, hey, we have this mm -hmm. specific way of thinking, of doing, of mm -hmm. experiencing God, and we're going to create a group around it. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that anyone who's Catholic or Orthodox would disagree with right. me. Right. <laughs> because they, since they were there from the beginning of yeah. the, the literal church just trying to figure out how to exist at all, they were what was they were who were represented at the all the councils and all the things in the 300s for her like whenever they all met so so they're like we formed this organization right. yeah <laughs> like there was nobody to report this to like we are the ones yeah <laughs> so um yeah because there's no you know council above all churches to say like hey we're forming a new denomination here's our paperwork of like it's kind of, I would say that most denominations formed out of um, a movement that was um, some sort of uh, theologian or somebody's belief about something or uh, frustration with 
usually the Catholic Church. Uh, and so they sort of gained a following, had p- other people who were like, yeah, yeah, I'm on board with that. And so it's, they all form organically. Mm-hmm. Can you give us like a little overview of like the differences between like the major Protestant denominations? Yeah. So I would, I think the easiest way to describe it is that they all do the majority of the ones that you named, um, come out of that Protestant reformation, which is happens around the 1500s. Um, and that's, Literally, it describes what's happening. They are reforming the Catholic Church. They're like all these different people and different movements around all around Northern Europe who are um, have different problems with the Catholic Church. Um, so it would s- swing all the way from we're we're keeping it pretty much the same, which is the Episcopalian, the Anglican Church, the Church of England. Uh, except for a few tweaks here and there, all the way to reformed churches, which is um, there where they're like, we want to get do away with almost everything that you've said. Um, so those would be the people that adhere to um, what they call the technical language, which is the sola scriptura. So if you've heard that before, I've definitely um, heard that before. That's only, yeah. only scripture. Um, that's the only thing that should inform our faith. And that's the only thing that should tell us what to do, how, what to believe. So they do away with a lot of theologians from before and any doctrines, a lot of doctrines from before. And so that would be uh, all the way on the far far end of that would be um well I don't want to make him sound like they're radical but like uh Presbyterian and um Baptist are more on that end of the spectrum versus the Anglican and um the, well the Methodist movement comes out of the Anglican so I don't want to get too um too broken down yet but basically you have reformed and church of england on either end of the spectrum of how reformed do we want to get <laughs> mm. so okay let's talk about methodists for a second okay so what it, it feels like um each of these denominations came out of a necessity mm-hmm. of some kind either there's disgruntlement with the catholic church mm-hmm. or there's disagreement in theology or in practice mm-hmm. or you know how are we sculpting our beliefs mm-hmm. what necessity birthed the movement of methodism yeah so john wesley and his brother charles were both anglican uh, they were raised when i say anglican i mean church of england and church of england is really similar to the catholic church if anybody remembers from history class it's basically just that henry the eighth wanted to be able to get divorced um but pretty much kept most of the beliefs the same other than uh that the divorce and that now Shocker, King of England is now the head of the church, not the Pope. <laughs> um, but pretty much a lo- uh, most of the theology and beliefs are pretty similar. Um, so they grew up Church of England. Their dad was a preacher or a priest. Um, and they were, John Wesley was studying to become a ca- uh, not Catholic, sorry, Anglican priest. He's rolling in his yeah, he, right now. Right, he's <laughs> like, ah, Gracie, uh, what have I done? <laughs> All my work for nothing. Um, and so he and some of his friends and Charles, while they were at school, uh, formed uh, this sort of club of they felt like people weren't living out their faith in a real way. They wanted it to be tangible. They wanted people to grow in their faith. They felt like people were just kind of like showing up and, um, going through the motions, but there wasn't like a real relationship or real growth or, um, evidence for their faith. And so they formed what they called the Holy club, which like, Oh my gosh, how pretentious. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, but other people called them Methodists because there seemed to be a method to how they did things like that. They would once a week, go visit the sick once a week, go visit the poor. Um, they would read their Bibles. They would get together and talk about their scriptures. Um, they would encourage each other. So they had this sort of list of things that they would all do as a practice of their faith. So it was really born out of a re- need for a revival is what mm. John Wesley would say. And then he began to hold revival meetings, um, out preaching out in the fields and people would come and it was wild. Like people flocked to him. And, but the funny thing is that John Wesley would never call himself anything besides Anglican. Like he started what he would call a movement and then, um, it became a church only because of it happened, uh, during the time of the American colonies. And once England and America went their separate ways, they, uh, they wanted, there's, there's some tension there of like still being tied to Britain. And so, um, but also a need for um, priests in America to be, teaching this movement and to be serving communion. And so John Wesley gave the blessing for them to have their own church apart from the Anglican church, but he would have never called himself anything besides Anglican. So the Methodist church was formed in his lifetime. Yes. And he actually kind of sanctioned it. Even yes. Though he was he like, would... okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. He's like, because you're across the ocean and I can't go ordain priests, you are now like have the authority to ordain priests Mm. that splintering mass splintering happened, you know, after the Protestant reformation and it's still happening today. Like Mm -hmm. I think that we're all, especially in the United Methodist church, we are very aware that people disagree on things and then they say, I can't live in this house anymore. I'm moving out. And it's been happening, you know, for the past couple of years, it's been really, really building. Um, What is the United Methodist Church view on the diversity of denominations within Mm. Christianity? I tend to think that United Methodists, um, we, maybe I'm biased. I know I'm biased, (laughs) have, grace for other denominations and we as in our at our best assume grace Mm -hmm. for other denominations and it's very hard not to uh you know be biased and in having conversations with people who are in different denominations or whatever um but trying to assume a position of grace um i mean we recognize and affirm baptisms of all denominations that baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, We let everybody come take communion. Uh, We recognize that you've been a Christian. If I mean, like that you've been part of another church. We don't say like, oh, but you've never been really a Christian until you came to our church. So we are very affirming of all denominations as Christians. Um, and so I tend to appreciate that, that we tend to err on the side of inclusivity. And we're like, we're going to assume that God has been doing, which is a very Wesleyan thing, that we're going to assume that God has been doing work in you from the beginning. Um, who are we to say that, you know, God that, hasn't been working? Yeah. 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 I I think... I guess that's one thing that I don't think of very often that is unique to United Methodism because there are a lot of churches that don't accept your baptism if Mm. you weren't baptized in their church or you have to be an official member of their church before you can partake in communion Mm -hmm. or all of these things. And since I grew up in the Methodist church, it's just something I never thought about Mm -hmm. of like, well, yeah, of course, anyone like Christianity doesn't have, this is just the way I prefer to learn. Like it has nothing to do with it being the right way. It's just the way that I like, you know, (laughs) everyone else has their own way. Right. I just kind of assumed other denominations looked exactly like ours and, but just like preached a little differently or had like a different cross in the background. Yeah. They (laughs) just didn't have the flame on their cross. Right. Yeah. And so the first time going to a church of another denomination was very like, oh, this feels different. Yeah. Like I, there is a difference in 
atmosphere somehow. Well, as a pastor, how do you navigate those differences between denominations um, while still emphasizing unity and common ground? within Christianity. Like when I interact with people from other denominations or... I think that when you are specifically confronted with the differences, not just interacting, because like we interact with people of different denominations and different faiths right. every yeah. single day. Yeah. But when you come up uh, against someone who you're just on totally different mm. wavelengths when it comes to theology and an understanding of God's love and what God's kingdom looks like. Mm. How do you handle that? Ugh. Perfectly every time. <laughs> <laughs> With all of the grace and it, yeah. Yeah. At my best, I would like to say that I um, want to assume grace always. Um, I also tend to be a non-confrontational person, so I'm going to keep mo a I'll tend to th keep most of my thoughts inside unless it's something that I think is harmful for other people around that, that somebody is saying something that is harmful or hurtful uh, that they have no business saying. Um, then I'll usually say something if it's um, personally, if, if it's offensive to somebody. Um, but I, I really do try to assume, um, you know, I not that I'm right, they're wrong, or that they're right and I'm wrong, but maybe we can both be right. And maybe, um, you know, based on their experience, this is how they've gotten here. And I, I really do try to assume grace. That's the best way. Um, it's, I mean, it's really hard because I'm very, I clearly have a lot of bias in that I have said, I'm called to serve the United Methodist Church, God's church in the form of the United Methodist Church. So I tend to think that we do a lot of things well and pretty firmly believe the things that we believe. I mean, you've chosen to dedicate your life, my entire to, life to it. So <laughs> I feel pretty strongly about my beliefs. But and so it's really hard when I'm sitting there with people who fundamentally believe something completely different. Um, but I really I really try to look for our common ground and where we're unified. And for me, I come across it most often in uh, serving type capacities. And so that is, that way it's easier to because it's that is essentially where all of our common ground is and is in the mission of Jesus Christ, which is to love God and love mm -hmm. others. So um, I, I find it easier than maybe in other circumstances because we're meeting on the grounds of our common ground. Um, I mean, it's really hard though. That, so that's you at your best. What that's about at, at your best. worst? <laughs> <laughs> what about Alyssa, I don't want this on record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. At my worst, I get defensive and, um, maybe passive aggressive about, oh, well, in our church, we do blah, blah, blah. Or like, oh, see, we do it differently. Like, yeah. and say, and I, I could get condescending. I've, <laughs> because I think the way that we do it is more, I, is more correct. Yeah. <laughs> I tend to, I firmly believe in the way we do it. Um, so that's me at my worst. <laughs> well, I think me at my best is just I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and I'm not at my best very often. Um, no, because I think what I, I, man, especially if someone else is in the room that I feel is being put down mm -hmm. or something they're saying is offensive to the situation. I, let me tell you the number one place that I have come into, uh, denominational collisions and also the most inappropriate place is funerals. <laughs> like it has, yeah. and it's, it's happened at multiple funerals of like my grandmother's mm. funeral, people saying things to me that I found to be yeah. offensive yeah. and at other people's fu funerals, pu things being depending on like what churches things being preached that mm. I find offensive. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. and it is, I'm just like, Oh my gosh. Like this is the most vulnerable. Yeah. In intimate moments Oof, in people's true. lives. And like, it sometimes feels like you can't,
can't say anything because then you're the one being, you know, insensitive. Yeah. 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 Um, But I, yeah, you're passive aggressive. I'm aggressive aggressive. (laughs) Which (laughs) passive aggressive is not better by any means. It's still aggressive. I think it's a little more socially acceptable. Well, maybe. (laughs) maybe it's socially acceptable, but people are just as offended. Um, but I wish I could, I handle it better. Cause I think that there is this, um, you know, I, I always comment on, I hate it when people speak in absolutes Mm -hmm. about theology and that, you know, they're very clear of like, well, this is what the Bible says. This is what it means. And, um, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you don't agree with me, then you're on, you know, you're not on God's side. Right. You know, and that is very, you're right. That's like the hardest and I don't know how, but, but then like sometimes in the way that I respond to it, I'm like, man, I'm being exactly like this person by right. saying, no, this is right, the way, right, right. you know? And I think, so one way, um, I have, cause I, that I've absolutely encountered that is inviting and that uh, it's not always done tactfully, but inviting them to say, believe or that something else might be true um, or say that's not necessarily how I see it. And just um, to put it out there and so that they can sort of get the idea that not everybody agrees with them. And so their way might not be the only true way. Well, I, I wanted, we've been talking in general generalities and I'd like for us to get more specific on like, what are some of the do- denominational differences that we've come up against mm-hmm. and how we've approached them or mm-hmm. handled them, or maybe how you've been able to explain that you see things a little differently. Okay. So more specifics. Yeah. Um, so one of I, denominations differ on theology that's kind of where it all comes from. Um, and I would say one of the biggest differences one, that you could lump peop- lump denominations into categories is the idea of free will versus predestination. And so that's basically say, th- saying, do I believe that God has given us humans freedom of choice in all circumstances which includes believing in god or do i believe that god has predestined people uh not only to who will b- choose to believe in god believe in jesus christ um but has predestined all every single thing to happen on earth um so you can tend to lump people a lump I say people denominations into one of those two categories um so the Methodist movement falls it and uh falls into the free will the freedom of choice um category and then do you I mean you want me to give examples of yeah so so some churches that fall that would be the churches that are on the reformed side the um, so your uh, Presbyterians, uh, your Baptists, and um, I mean, any there's like Reformed Church of America. So there's like smaller denominations that are in there as well. On the predestination side or on, on the, the predestination side? side. So oh. on the free will side, you have United Methodist churches, any Wesleyan church, um, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox. This was the first time I had seen this. Um, when I, cause I was looking to see like, is there a number on how many denominations there were? And Wikipedia has actually divided them into Nicene, ni- the Nicene denominations and then restorationists, which are your Mormons, your universal, your, uh, what is it? The UU, the Unitarian Universalists, um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So, and I was like, what, how do you lump those together? Um, but there are people, those denominations believe that there were things that were lost from the Bible or lost from Jesus's teaching and they're trying to restore them. Mm. So, um, they've lumped it into like a different, like created a different, um, 
categories and the Nicene ones are ones who adhere to the Nicene Creed, which is that I believe in God the Father. It's the basic tenets of Christian faith and all the ones, all the churches that we think of as mainline Protestant, Catholic, and all of that would be Nicene churches. Yeah. I don't know if, so one of the differences in denominations that I've come across often, but it's not as one side or the other mm-hmm. as a free will and predestination mm-hmm. is the attitude towards salvation mm-hmm. and uh, what it takes to be saved. Okay. Yes. Yes, sola uh, fide, and so what does that mean? Uh, by faith alone. Oh yeah, by and by grace alone. Sola, I don't know. <laughs> Latin <Grace>. for grace. <laughs> sola grace. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, believers' baptism versus, uh, or well, I guess that's sep- that might even be separate. But believers' baptism versus um, baptism of all ages. Um, the believer's baptism really only came out of the Anabaptist church, which, um, formed at the Protestant reformation time, but completely, uh, away from like the Anglicans. So they were fell more on the side of the reformed and, uh, Calvinist. I didn't, that's the first time I've dropped Calvin in there. Um, so they were, um, they were their name comes from to be baptized again because they were they believed the way they interpreted the scripture was that you need to be, uh you can only be baptized in declaring your own personal belief and that baptisms before you can declare that yourself don't count and so that's why they were their name was like Anna Baptist baptize again um but then they dropped the Anna and they just became known as Baptists um um, yeah, I would tend, I think we would in America right now think that, um, that was a big division, but I think it's really because Baptists are the biggest denomination outside of Catholicism in America. And so it seems like more people, like that's a bigger division in churches, but it's really only Baptist and any church that is, um, Baptist adjacent, um, which like adheres to similar Baptist beliefs, but doesn't want to be lumped in with, um, the Baptist churches and how they, uh, how they have bureaucracy. I, as not, as a person who's not Baptist, I don't really know how their system works other than it's sort of a confederation somewhat. Um, so really more churches, more denominations um, tend to believe in salvation as a more holistic thing versus a believer's baptism. Yeah. Like a moment in time. Right. Do you see, uh, these differences in denomination, do you think that they're divisive or do you think that it like how it, it, it feels unhealthy to me, Mm -hmm. like for us to have so many different denominations and at the root, it does feel divisive, but I'll also be the first to say like, well, I'm not going to convert to a different denomination that I don't align with. So like I'm part of the problem too, is like, I'm unwilling to bend outside of my belief structure, you know, but like, what do what do we do with all this? I know it's almost, um, because what's, what's the phrase I'm trying to think of where it's the luxury of having a choice at all. Um, that we're, that Christianity is so, it's the biggest religion in the world that we have the luxury of choosing to fall, be in a church that aligns so specifically with what we believe. Um, And so, yeah, I think it can get unhealthy because how cool that it's the biggest religion in the world, but how frustrating is it that we're like then the most divided? Um, We're supposed to be unified over one thing, um, but I'm with you on that. I would have a hard time worshiping in a place that didn't, that was fun, believed 
a few things differently from me, some things that I count as core beliefs um, that other churches wouldn't necessarily. Um, but I think about churches in some other countries where you just get, if you, you have a church, that's the one you go to, or even in small towns in America, like you there just, are two churches to choose from. Right. And yeah. so you just pick the one that maybe has the better, uh, has the better preacher or just has the better communion bread. I don't know. Like, so for us, especially in suburbia um, and in Texas, where in Texas, literally oh like gosh. there is a literally there is a church on every corner at the intersection. Mm-hmm. Our church is located. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which I I point out like on the, the regular to people. I'm like, you know, we're not we a are lack- a stone's throw away from three other churches Yeah, of different of which I guess would make sense, but of completely different denominations. Yes. Um, so people really have their choice. Um, to go wherever they want. And so there's a beauty in being able to worship in a way that affirms the beliefs that you hold about Jesus, but also um, it's really always good to be challenged in questioning of what else could be true, um, humbling ourselves and that maybe I'm not right all the time about everything, uh, which is just the worst feeling in the world sometimes. But I think it, so in that way, it is healthy to have different beliefs. I don't think Jesus is proud of us having (laughs) different denominations. Um, I think that would be really frustrating. I think that would be the first thing Paul would say if people will say like, what would Paul write about churches in America? It's like, I think the first thing he would be like, well, why do you all have different names on like everything? Um, so I think like anything, humanity can make it good or bad. Um, and at our best, we partner in our common mission and making the name of Jesus Christ known in tangible and loving ways. Um, and at our worst, we are at each other's throats and cut each other off from families and, um, really make a lot more hurt, but I don't know. It does feel divisive. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder like, what did Jesus expect? <laughs> like that sounds but it's it's like this was a huge ask of like he he understood the uh fault in human nature mm-hmm. because he saw it all around him mm-hmm. all the time and fell victim to it when yeah. he was crucified, mm-hmm. you know? And he constantly talked about love and unity and mm-hmm. harmony and, you know, all of this and people weren't getting it and weren't getting it and weren't getting it. Mm-hmm. Like was the expectation was after he was gone, we would get it. I don't know. But one thing I did think of that occurred to me that we didn't have addressed yet is that once Christianity became a, uh, legal. And when I say legal, it became somewhat married, not somewhat, it became married to the empire uh, with Constantine. Before that, you don't see any sort of fighting or a denomination. People are literally dying for this faith. It's so radical that the people who are dedicated to it, um, I don't really, I, they didn't have the time or the energy to be disagreeing. They were just squabbling over right. like, and so I'm what not, exactly does this word mean? Right. Yeah. And so not saying that that's better than for Christians to be persecuted. Cause it, I mean, people were being killed over this, but when you are the underdog, when you are not in power, um, when you have everything to lose, um, you don't focus a lot on the differences. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm not, I don't want that to come across as like, um, so they had it better when they were being martyred, but Christianity fundamentally changed once it was, once Constantine took it on and made it the the empirical religion. Um, Suddenly being a Christian meant you had power. Mm -hmm. And so once you have power, you get room to disagree because you're not going to be killed for, um, claiming the name of Jesus. So. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I totally understand what you're saying of like, it, we're not saying, hey, it's better to be a martyr, but mm-hmm. like when 
you are in major life upheaval of any sort, you do become laser focused on what really matters. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be a sudden death. Sometimes it can be a natural disaster. It can be all sorts of things. But in that moment, you're a man like life is fleeting. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I really going to care about? What am I really going to dedicate my life to? Mm -hmm. And so if you're constantly on the run for your faith, like, you know what you're dedicating your life to. It's mm -hmm. the pursuit of love and the way that yeah, you Jesus have, put out there. Yeah. You have given everything to, you're saying it is worth it for me to uh, risk my life for this. So I'm not going to say, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Um, you're like all in and don't have room for, mm -hmm. and you latch onto the people who are also all in. Um, in your opinion, do you think that denominational differences are mostly theological or cultural? Because I think of like the splintering that's happening right now in the mm. United Methodist Church, and it feels more, it feels like a mix of mm -hmm. culture and theology. Hmm. That is difficult to say because I would my gut would my initial thought would say theological because that's how people distinguish them but do they I think they must be informed by cultural beliefs um, because we're not in a vacuum that every society has sort of in ground in uh, beliefs that are didn't come from uh, the Bible but inform how they read the Bible or inform how they understand God. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my cop-out answer is that it must be a mix, um, but painted in, a the in theological terms, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that sometimes we, we make the mistake of we don't recognize our own biases mm -hmm. when it comes to reading scripture and the way that we interpret scripture. Like, obviously, I'm going to read scripture very differently as a white woman who grew up in the suburbs and, you know, lives in the city of Dallas. I'm going to read very differently than other people. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not other white women who grew up in the suburbs, <laughs> right. but you know, you know what I'm saying. But somebody across the world who... Yeah has never doesn't live in a Christian country and like yeah, yeah but I and I I assign my beliefs I find a way to make scripture retrofit my biases mm -hmm. right and so I read it and I'm interpreting it a certain way yep. and then I take it and I tell other people this is what it means mm -hmm. as if I found the answer right as if the white millennial, suburban belief is the one true way to understand this. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I get you. <laughs> and so that's where we find people who think like us. <laughs> yeah. And so I, it's so frustrating because I wish on one hand, I wish that I exposed myself more to like other mm -hmm. ways of thinking and being and feeling and uh, experiencing God. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, when I have sometimes exposed myself to those things, I don't like what I see. No, I don't and, <laughs> and so like I, but is that just part of it? Is it making ourselves uncomfortable breaking mm -hmm. outside of this structure that we've created for ourselves to be able to be in community with other denominations. Yeah. I think it does require, um, I think that's always a healthy practice to not only make ourselves understand why we believe what we believe, but to how else will we grow if we don't question or don't consider, um, how we see the world? Um, I mean, that's how all theologians have got like began to express things is because they started to see the world in a new way or they questioned something like everything that's a reformation is like they reform something because they're like, Hey, wait a second. I'm thinking this, I'm thinking a little differently than this guy or this understanding. Um, so I think it's really, it's really healthy to do that. It's definitely scary and uncomfortable. Um, 
And sometimes it makes you believe what you believe stronger, but sometimes it helps you to have an expanded view of God, which I think God really loves thinking or getting to see that God is just not in a box that we, how we understand it. What if God is bigger? Are you saying God's you not, not United Methodist? Oh, shoot. (laughs) (laughs) No. Um, well, Let's talk about unity for a little bit Um, because we've talked a lot about differences and divisiveness and distinctions in denominations. How can we do a better job of focusing on our core Mm. beliefs and values uh, to find unity and harmony with each other? Because sometimes it feels like all we focus on are the differences. Yeah, it does. And it's exhausting to do that because we'll just nitpick and argue and that doesn't get us anywhere um something that's like i think this was where i train of thought that i lost um that we're never going to convince somebody we're i i tend to be thinking like i'm how am i going to be the one that is going to be that convinces somebody that they were wrong nobody wants to be convinced that they were wrong <laughs> um, but when we focus on our unity, um, our common mission, what is our common mission? We call we all say that we're followers of Jesus Christ, that we all believe Jesus Christ was a pretty important person, God. Um, and if we can, I don't know how, I don't know the secret sauce to making us focus on that more than our differences, but in any time, um, there's a, a cause greater than our individual church, our denomination, like a natural disaster, like, a. I mean, when COVID happened, churches and, and faith communities, and even just like nonprofits banded together to do good in the world. And so I don't mean to say that we need a, a crisis, cause. Yeah. right? A crisis or something bad to happen but in like, order why to can't, come together. Why can't Jesus be our common cause? Right. You would hope and you would think that Jesus would be. Um, but there, I mean, like right now, I think of in the Louisville Independent School District has called upon all faith communities to come together and be united around the schools um, because all of us have people, everybody who's part of our faith communities are, we all touch the school district in some way. Um, if it's not our own kids, it's our neighbor's kids, it's our congregation's kids. And so that's one, like, that's one tangible example, um, that has given me hope that's like, Hey, we are all, yeah, we know that like we're across our churches are across the street from each other, but like here we both are because all our kids go to the same schools and like, we want what's best for all our kids. Um, not just my kids, not just, and you don't, it's like you, we care about each other. Um, so if we can find a common cause and I think we're, uh, so places like a school district place, things like other nonprofits that do good work, you find people from different denominations participating in those. Um, there are even interdenominational churches, um, that, so my friend lives in New York city and she attended a church that has pastors, the, a Methodist pastor or Presbyterian pastor and a Lutheran pastor. And they all pastor this one church. That's cool. Is that cool? Like I'd never heard of that, but apparently that's not unheard of. So there are ways people are doing them. Uh, they're just not getting. So as basically, much attention. those pastors have to come together and say, mm-hmm. "What is our common ground?" Yeah. So that we can make sure that we're preaching in the same, like mm-hmm. we're not offending people. Yeah, it's cool. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. it'd almost be like, what could that be like? Um, if what if what if churches had to mix like pastors of different beliefs? Oh, that would be so t- tough for me. <laughs> <laughs> that you get sent around to different churches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And having to work with people of different denominations like that just feels tough. Different priorities, right. different perspective. Some like, of them wouldn't think I should be there at all. Yeah. So 
<laughs> that would be a tough one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, okay. So if someone who is curious about exploring different denominations mm. uh, and they're just like super confused by this whole conversation because there's Shocker. so much. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's so much information. Like we've barely even touched the surface oh my gosh, of yeah. the history of denominations, the differences between them. Mm -hmm. Um what advice or insight would you offer to someone to help them navigate this mm. journey of like choosing the denomination that most resonates with their spirit? Mm. I feel like I lucked in. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say I lucked into it. Obviously, I was raised in the Methodist church and I continued to be Methodist because oftentimes you do what you were raised to do. Right. So which is true. I can't take credit. I'm like, I was going to be so pompous and like oh well I got lucky because <laughs> I grew up in the church that resonates with me and it's like yeah dummy why do because you think it resonates, it resonates with, with you <laughs> <laughs> and listen me too that's oh my crazy. gosh that's incredible <laughs> oh my gosh I just realized how stupid no, that was no <laughs> but that's I mean I I know what you were trying to get at yeah um that's a really good question because especially if they're here or in the South, if they're in Texas, if they're in Dallas, there is no shortage of churches. Um, how do you even begin to navigate? You just have to start somewhere. And I would say your gut would tell you, I say, think that your gut is the Holy Spirit in you, um, would tell you if it feels like a place of love, if it feels like a place that you can grow in your relationship with God, um, that will help you be loving, that will help you be a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, I, th I think you just have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you can do as much research as you want, but like you can do that till the cows come home. Like there's so many, um, and you can, I mean, you can start by looking at different denominational websites, but um, you're really not going to get a feel for it until you just try. Um, and even, I mean, you can try worshiping online to see if you like the gist of that. But if you're looking to grow in relationship with Jesus Christ, and you need, I tend to believe that you need other people to do that in some way. Um, there's a different feeling when you're in the church building or you're in a physical space. So I would just start somewhere, mm -hmm. go with, go with a friend if that's what you want to do or go by yourself so you can be completely up to your own discretion. But I, I think the Holy Spirit will guide you into a place that will nurture you, um, into a person who follows Jesus Christ. Mm. Yeah. I like, um, the, a question that you kind of put out of like, is this a place that will help me learn to love better? Mm. And I think that that's a really, really good starting point yeah. is like, can I learn to love better from these people from mm. this group, like based on what I've experienced yeah. today? Yeah. And some, I, there are some churches that I've walked into that I was like, I don't think this is going to teach me how to love better. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And that's not to say that it doesn't teach some people how to learn love better. Right. That's, trying to be yeah but yeah but me personally how I will receive that is yeah I'm not going to be open to that and like what is like for I don't know love might be different for me yeah. than it is for someone else what it is to feel love what it is to give love yeah. like all of that um it might not be the same as how someone else feels love and right you know gives love and yeah. so it's not better or worse I feel like we get caught up in that mentality all the time of like when we think of a journey we think of like points to a final destination and the further you are in the journey the better you are mm. and that's not really what this whole thing is it's like we're all on different points in yeah like a scatter map or something right, right. that like we it's really not linear no or, yeah. no absolutely not so try new things maybe maybe write down a list of what your values are yeah I don't know. yeah that could be a great place to start see too. if this church aligns with your values yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely but uh i hope that y'all will try um different denominations different worship experiences i think it makes us better to yeah experience different things different ways of thinking different yeah. ways of being yeah yeah i agree all right thanks gracie yeah <laughs>
The Life Plus God podcast is hosted, written, and produced by me, Alyssa Robinson, and sponsored by Treach Memorial United Methodist Church in Flower Mound, Texas. Check out Treach online at tmumc.org or in person to see if this church is a right fit for you and your family. We'd love for you to visit us soon. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to subscribe and rate us on your podcast platform to help other people find our content. Join us next week and let's keep growing in relationship with Christ together.